way we express the love of Jesus Christ and the passion that he had is that we go out there and we serve others. We go to the out-of-bound places, the ends of the earth. The world is changing, but the gospel doesn't change. The message of the cross doesn't change. We're going to make every effort to share the gospel. The world has been decimated by COVID-19, but the work here at Samaritan's Purse, it never stops. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do it through Operation Christmas Child. It's a platform that God has given Samaritan's Purse to share the gospel more than 10 million times every year. Jesus loves you. The wonderment of it is that the child's encounter is not with material things. My faith encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time.
I'll be reading today from Ephesians um, 2, 17 through 22. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And now Katrina is going to come up. She's got a few things to do. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. As you can see on the front of your bulletin, today is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. So we're going to take a few minutes and just say thank you to some people that pour into our lives. And uh, Mark kind of stole the surprise, but we want to thank Patty again. Um, she has just given so much these past few months by just stepping up to the plate, um, coming to practice on Wednesdays and playing for us on Sundays, and also her beautiful voice. And, you know, it's more than just playing the music and singing the words. It's leading us in worship, and so that is very critical. So, Patty, thank you again. So we hope to see you it. next year. <laughs> I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. Uh, Ron and Norma, we hope that you're watching this morning from home. Um, we would be very remiss if we didn't recognize Ron and Norma for all the service that they've given over the years. And unfortunately, they can't be with us this morning. But I don't think there's anybody here that hasn't been touched by their love and their kindness their generosity, um, the true spirit of Jesus, they just portray that so well. And so we love you, Ron and Norma. We miss you both, and we think about you often and pray for you every day. Thank you for all you've done. So the next recognition is kind of a combination thing because they're kind of a partnership. So. We want to recognize Mark and Pat. Um, the pastor's wife is not an easy role. I'm, uh, I've watched my cousin uh, be a pastor's wife. I've watched my daughter now be a pastor's wife. And there is so much more to it than we even know. All the phone calls that they field when their spouse is not available, the dinners that get interrupted, the plans that get changed because someone needs them, all the things that they listen to and the advice that they give us. So thank you, Pat, for everything that you do. Okay, now it's Mark's turn. Um, so the pastor has an easy job, right? They just show up on Sunday for an hour and an hour on Wednesday, and that's it. Uh, we all know that's not true. It's one of the most demanding and stressful jobs that there is. Uh, you spend hours researching, studying, trying to put together the perfect sermon every Sunday, that sermon that's going to move people, that's going to inspire people. Is it too long? Is it too short? Is there any humor? Am I going to offend anybody? There's just a lot that goes into it. And I know that Mark spends hours and hours not just preparing the sermon, but all that goes with the sermon, the video, and helping with the music. Um, also, the pastor is never clocks out. Um, his phone is on him 24 hours a day. He takes our calls whenever we need him, whether it's um, a death in the family, someone that's sick, someone that needs counseling. Um, hopefully we also call him with some joyous occasions once in a while. So thank you, Mark, for everything. Thank you for stepping up to the plate and guiding us here at Pleasant View. We love you. We appreciate you. And we just want to acknowledge all that you've done. I didn't forget Maureen. I also just want to recognize Maureen. Um, 
she does so much behind the scenes, and what she does is also a ministry for us. You know, she doesn't just print the bulletin. There's a hundred other things that she does, from the gardening and the flowers to keeping the church uh, looking spiffy, and not only the bulletin and the newsletter, but um, organizing things like this to appreciate other people in the church. So thank you, Maureen. And also thank you to the praise team for the wonderful job they do every Sunday. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Maureen has one more. <laughs> she did. <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. Let's sing. <laughs> Please join us singing. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father God, we humbly bow in your presence this morning and ask that the Spirit open our heart's door, illumine our eyes, open our ears, 
that we might hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A quick clip just to get us warmed up this morning. Well, good morning. I want to thank you for the gift, and most of all, I want to thank you for your support. Your words of encouragement and uh, are just so appreciated. I received a couple notes this past week. Thank you, and it's just a, an awesome privilege to serve as your pastor right now to guide us through this period of transition, if you will. And uh, I don't think I could be in a better place than to be at Pleasant View at this life journey, in my life journey at this point. So thank you. May God bless you. May God bless us as a church. Well, we've come to the end of our sermon series on the book of Romans. Now, as I've mentioned before, we could have spent... Weeks upon weeks in Romans had we got into, oh, the awesome detail that Paul provides. And um, we've just done an overview, to be quite honest with you. Our next series that we'll kick off next week, we'll, we'll, we're going to take a look at the joy we find in Philippians. So I hope that you'll be with us during that series. With our Roman series, we've talked through several key teachings and principles significant in the life of a believer and the health of a local church. If you'll recall, we've talked about the problem of sin, the rescue from sin, the purchase of righteousness, and God chooses us. I just rest on those words right there. God chooses us. Today, as we end our series, I believe we are going to explore one of the greatest principles Paul discusses in the book of Romans, becoming living sacrifices. Now, this is important because as we learn about sin, redemption, righteousness, etc., we are often left asking of ourselves and of God, okay, so now what? Well, today is an answer. Not a complete, full, exhaustive answer, but an answer to this question. If you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 12, and we'll get started. Our passage that we're going to focus on today is just three verses. But listen carefully, read carefully with me. Romans 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. 
Wow, what a challenge Paul calls upon us this morning. You know, he mentions that concept of living sacrifice. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, there are many special offerings made for lots of sacrificial offerings made for lots of different reasons. I think there's a living sacrifice there, too, the story of Isaac. All of those sacrifices were obviously dead, except for Isaac. But Paul decides to change the game a little bit, and he ups the ante with his scripture this morning. He calls for us as believers to become living sacrifices. Now, this type of sacrificial living requires us to be always willing to crawl back onto the altar for sacrifice. To crawl back on the altar for sacrifice. Or as Jesus says so eloquently in Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. It always won't be comfortable. There's no promise. And it invites us into potential suffering. But overall, it's what God desires for each of us. So how do we do this effectively? I believe that Paul offers a very simple guide for us in this passage. He talks about how the importance of saying no to the things of this world that require crawling off the altar to experience while instead sacrificially saying yes to the things of God. Ultimately, when we do, we will begin to understand more of our role to play in God's purposes. So let's look at those three points this morning. Say no to the world. The first thing Paul invites us to do is to simply say no to the patterns of this world. Well, that's easy, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I'm a firm believer that in everyone's life there are rhythms of one form or another. Some of us have healthy rhythms. For instance, we wake up early each morning, drink our cup of coffee, spend some time in God's Word and prayer, and then complete a morning workout before work or school. I didn't see too many smiles out there. Others of us, however, may find ourselves caught up in unhealthy rhythms. Now, let me share a quick story about me and my rhythms. When I was that last couple years that I was working as a school leader, I found myself really getting into a good, healthy rhythm of things. I would arise about 5 o'clock, which for me, if you know me, is really early. I would get a time to delve into the Word and to lift up prayers to God and to get on that elliptical and give a good workout. Now, that felt pretty good sometimes to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And this, this routine, though, flowed over with some of the best body weight figures that I've had in a long time. Eh, that's gone and with some really solid blood sugar scores. That good start to each morning seemed to carry over to the rest of the day, including those tough days in the office. Now, since retirement, it's, a, <laughs> it's been an ongoing merry-go-round of rhythms. Then the unhealthy rhythms teamed with the process of aging. I have to admit, I am getting older. And my body tells me that seemingly every day. Those unhealthy rhythm, rhythms, the aging, man, it can be stressful at times. Pray for me that I might get back into those healthy rhythms and stay there. With your prayer, support, and encouragement, I believe I can continue to develop the routine of serving you, serving the Lord, and to fulfill my seminary call and then the call to be 
the father, the husband, and the grandpa that I'm called to be as well. I can avoid those negative things like impatience, increased stress, and headaches, and a higher blood sugar level. By the way, Katrina mentioned Marine, how she can be a help. I, she, along with another person, Tina Pyle, were really give me some ongoing good advice. And uh, in recent weeks, I've heard from both of them. Step back, let the ladies in charge of the meal take care of the meal. They can and will do it. Yeah, I know they will. But sometimes I just get my hands involved and it's hard to delegate. <laughs> at least I have an awesome group to delegate to here at Pleasant View. So thanks, Maureen. And Tina's not with us this morning, but thank you, Tina. When I'm in these, this season, these unhealthy rhythm season, I allow the things of the world to lead me astray. I get stuck in a rhythmic cycle I don't know if I can get out of. However, I finally came to the conclusion that what God needed from me was a willingness to simply say no. Pat would hope I'd say no more often, wouldn't you, dear? <laughs> and in your life right now, maybe the first step towards the transformation for you is some internal dialogue between you and your sinful habit. Sin, you've been creeping back into my life every time I convince myself that you are gone. And even if you continue to present yourself to me as a temptation, I am telling you right now the answer in advance. It's going to be no. You may remember back a few weeks ago when we dealt with the problem of sin. And I shared Genesis 4, 7 with you. Let's go back and look at that. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must rule over it. Sin wants you. It wants all of us. But we must deny it. Maybe like you, you have an unhealthy rhythm in, in your life right now. Because we have been, as Paul says, trying to copy the behavior and customs of the world. When we have a rhythm in our life, we will be in some form or fashion mirroring something. Either we mirror the world and its values, or we mirror our God and His values. So we have received the initial instruction in Paul, and it's a subtraction that must take place. We learn to say no. So what do we respond with? If there's a no, what is the yes? The yes is to the way. Once you have been able to locate the worldly patterns that you've been following, the space is then created for God's transforming work to take place. Jesus modeled a life of humble sacrifice in pursuit of restoration and the redemption of mankind. In our Romans 12, 2 verse, Paul seems to be concerned with how we think. Our thought process is important when it comes to growth potential in the kingdom of God. Often the temptation to follow worldly patterns and values begins with a thought. But the same is true for the patterns Christ wants in our lives. Spending time reading and studying the word of God will give us the right type of thought process and help us respond well when we're confronted with the worldly things. And it's not something we can turn to every now and again or only on the bad days. Hmm. It must be a healthy routine and rhythm that we enter into. You'll be glad to know 
The Bible talks about this very concept. In Psalms 1-2, we read, Blessed is the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. I think that King David is a walking, talking example of the importance of meditating on God's Word day and night. God desires us to have the Word near us, but more importantly, He wants it in us, in our minds, in our hearts, and throughout our lives. The work of becoming a living sacrifice will require commitment like this. Perhaps there's something you need to change in your morning or evening routine to allow God to transform you, to transform you from the inside out by spending time with Him. First, you need to move worldly distractions out of the way and allow God to come and do a transforming work in your mind. Paul closes out Romans 12, 2 with an outcome once we take these steps towards sacrificial living. He says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So how do we discern our purpose? You know, even though Paul wrote this letter many years ago, it's amazing how God knew that we would, what we would need even now. There are many here today who have spent, spent time searching tirelessly for their purpose in life. You've tried to find it in the things of the world and figured out you couldn't. You tried to find it in a particular relationship and figured out you couldn't. You tried to find it by achieving a certain social media status and figured out you couldn't. Christ is the only one who can give you meaning and purpose in your life. He's called you to do great things for His kingdom here on earth. I wonder how many of us have yet to sense a calling from God because we've allowed our unhealthy rhythms to act as distractions, calling us off the altar. We haven't been able to sense God's leading because we haven't spent time with Him. The good news is this, folks. There's still time, right now, to rewire your life. The Bible is full of instances where God makes it clear there is still time to surrender. Actually, I think that one of the stories that immediately comes to, to mind to me was the story of the thief on the cross next to Jesus. Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. If this story doesn't convince you, there's still time to believe, still time to turn from sin and live a righteous life, I'm not sure what will. With God, every moment matters. 
He can use every moment of your life up to and out from this exact point. But if you want to know Christ and you want to understand your call, you need to choose Him above everything else every single day. And then, as Paul writes, then you will learn to know God's will for you. So let's put all this to work in our lives. The motive for dedication is love. Paul doesn't say, I command you, but I beseech you because of what God has already done for you. We serve him out of love and appreciation. This week I turned to Warren Wearsby for his thoughts. As you know, Dr. Wearsby is a favorite theologian pastor of mine. Here are some of his thoughts. True dedication is the presenting of body, body, mind, and will to God day by day. It's daily yielding the body to Him, having the mind renewed by the Word, and surrendering the will through prayer and obedience. Every Christian is either a conformer, living for and like the world, or a transformer, daily becoming more like Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us that we are transformed or transfigured as we allow the Spirit to reveal Christ through the Word of God. It is only when the believer is thus dedicated to God that he can know God's will for his life. God does not have three wills, good, better, and best, or good, acceptable, and perfect. It's not like when we go shopping and we're looking at the items you can buy, the good, the better, or the best product. Rather, we grow in our appreciation of God's will. Some Christians obey God because they know that obedience is good for them and they fear chastening. Others obey because they find God's will acceptable. But the deepest devotion is in those who love God's will and find it perfect. Wearsby continues and closes with these thoughts. As priests, we are to present spiritual sacrifices to God. And the first sacrifice he wants each day is our body, our mind, and will in total surrender to him. We can jump back to Joel in the Old Testament. Chapter 2, verse 12. He writes, Every, e excuse me, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. This seems to be going all the way back to the book of Genesis, the Lord's heart for his creation. That humankind would willingly choose to return to Him, to forsake all the idols, to turn from all of the sin, and to eliminate all the distractions, and simply return to relationship with Him. And so we have Jesus. Christ came to this very earth. He was tempted by the same worldly things that you are tempted by, yet He did not sin and ultimately he was nailed to a cross for our sins so we could be transformed into walking talking reflections of him and this is as good as day as any to respond in earnest to this specific outpouring of grace identify the areas of sin and distraction in your life. Pursue the three R's, righteousness, redemption, and reconciliation. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice day in and day out. There's no one too far gone, and there's no offering too small or large. Give him a minute. Perhaps an hour, or better yet, a lifetime, and he will use it.
to the fullest extent of his glory. As Paul says in Romans chapter 16, the closing verses, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, you have called us. And your call includes your amazing love, mercy, and grace. You have called us to say no to the world and its wily ways. To say yes to you. And that we might discern our purpose, your purpose for our lives. Help us to be the living sacrifices that Paul writes about. We can't do it on our own. We need you. We humbly present ourselves to you this morning. Lead us in the life, in the way that you would have us go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing in closing Blessed Assurance. sacrifice is not an easy challenge. That's why Jesus told us we would have the helper. He would send the helper. The Spirit is here to guide us and to help us along. And I look out and those that are gathered here this morning, 
You have brothers and sisters that are gathered here today. Some are not here today, but they most willingly would give all they can to help guide you, just as you would give them all that you can. So be a light. Be hands and feet to your brothers and sisters, and especially to those that don't even know that Jesus Christ died and was resurrected on the cross for them. Let's let's close this morning with this passage from Romans. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.